All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, my name is Cece Cunningham. I am the executive director of the Chris Klug Foundation. Um, this is our very first webinar of 2022, um, which is a part of our patient ambassador program. We do it every year, but we are especially thankful to be starting off this year with our Women in Transplant webinar. How exciting. Um, I'll be your moderator for today. Um, just some housekeeping. Uh, if you're new to Zoom webinar, you'll notice that you have a Q&A box um, down below to field questions to the panelists on your console. Uh, we're going to have a brief Q&A at the end of the presentation, so we encourage you to type your questions into the, the Q&A, not the chat, as they come to mind. Um, before I introduce our guest speakers, I would first like to thank our generous sponsor, the Hearts for Rest Foundation, for their support in making this monthly webinar series possible. I would also like to thank our special presenting partners today, Lifebulb, for their support. Now, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, here we go. First up, we have Hillary Bowdy. Hillary is a living kidney donor and a passionate advocate for organ donation. Her donation journey began on New Year's Eve 2020 when she viewed a news broadcast about a Long Island business executive in desperate need of a kidney transplant. Inspired by her own family's medical struggles, she spent the next several weeks researching the entailments of being a living donor. Five months later, in May 2021, she donated her kidney to a stranger through the National Kidney Registry's Standard Voucher Program. Bowdy continues to raise awareness and advocate for living kidney donation as a member of the National Kidney Donor Organization, or NKDO. Bowdy resides in Waterford, Connecticut, with her husband and two young daughters. She is a kindergarten teacher and is currently pursuing her doctoral degree in educational leadership, social, emotional, and academic learning, as well as social justice. She is a competitive marathon runner, <laughs> and we had the pleasure of having her on our 2021 New York City Marathon charity team. Uh, and she does have plans to compete in her first Ironman triathlon in 2022. So kudos to you, Hillary. That is uh, amazing, <laughs> amazing work. Um, next, we have Lisa Kosia. Lisa is currently the Senior Research Coordinator for the Transplant Pregnancy Registry International, or TPRI for short. She has over 30 years of experience in the field of transplantation, including um, as a staff nurse, transplant coordinator, and research coordinator for the TPRI for the past 24 years. Lisa is also the chair of the American Society of Transplantation's Women's Health Community of Practice, um, and she's also written and co-authored many chapters and journal articles. She's also presented numerous abstracts at national and international meetings on the topic of pregnancy after transplantation. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Next, we have Karen Heenberger. She is both a kidney and pancreas transplant recipient, as well as a leading medical and business expert in the biopharmaceutical industry. She has more than 15 years of experience in leadership positions at J&J, iTech Pharmaceuticals, Coronado Biosciences, and also as an investment professional at two large funds, Brummer & Partners and Scandinavian Life Science Ventures. Her dedication to diabetes is reflected by her time on the senior team at the JDRF and conducting her postdoctorate at the Joslin Diabetes Center, Harvard Medical School. She received her MD and PhD at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, where she retains a position with the Department of Endocrinology and Surgery. In 2014, she co-founded Lifebulb, our presenting partners today, together with Mr. Ricardo Braglia, CEO Helsin, and Dr. Steven Squinto, venture partner or Orbamed. Lifebulb's overall mission is to reduce the burden of chronic disease through empowering patient entrepreneurs and ambassadors. Thank you for joining us. Lastly, we have Sarah Granados. Sarah is a five-time, that's right, five-time transplant recipient, as well as a wife, mother, and believer. While her passions include spending time with her family, doing anything outdoors, all things animals, and spreading awareness about organ donation, her journey hasn't been an easy one. Although Sarah's story has been plagued with hard parts, she's chosen to live with hope and joy in a world where it is definitely very much needed. Her goal is to inspire others to live well, live intentionally, and donate life. Thank you for joining us today, Sarah. 
Um, as I mentioned, my name is Cece Cunningham. I am the executive director of the Chris Kluge Foundation. Um, and basically what we do, we are a nonprofit 501c3 organization, um, a national nonprofit that educates and advocates for organ, eye, and tissue donation. Um, we do this by educating others on its importance, um, inspiring those touched by donation and registering more organ donors nationwide. So with that said, I think I will jump into some discussion questions. So first up, Sarah, <laughs> five transplants. So uh, I think that's where we can uh, jump off. Can you elaborate on your you know, transplant journey and what your experience was like navigating through the ups and downs of the five transplants that you received? So yes, yeah, so I am the gift of multiple organs. Um, I um, it was done in one one surgery, um, but yeah, you know, transplant life it can um, be a roller coaster. Um, there's lots of ups and downs, and um, you know, until you are the recipient or or on the other side of it, where you're the you know what I call the angel donor, um, you don't understand like how much there is to, you know, to it and just how tedious um, and, and hard, you know, the journey can be. But the beauty of it is that at the end of the day, like in my case, I went from a terminal diagnosis um, where we were running out of every single option to being given hope um, through the gift of, of life. And, and it had somebody not done that for me, um, you know, my kids would have lost their mama and my husband would have lost his wife. And so um, I've always been an organ donor. Um, but now that I've now that I've experienced it from this side, um, it's, it's everything to us. And, you know, it's never a matter of just checking a box for the sake of checking the box. It's a matter of giving families hope and like possibilities like I didn't get to dream before because my doctors were telling me I didn't have a future. And now, you know, because I was gifted this transplant, I have so many dreams and so many aspirations and so many things that I'm looking forward to. Um, and so, yeah, you know, um, I will say I waited 444 days and had eight dry runs in that process. And, and so making those life flights and, um, going through those processes over and over and over is, is hard emotionally, financially, physically. But then when you're actually, you know, given the gift of life, all of the hard, all of the tears, all of the, the pain involved in it, it is worth it. And um, it, it has been a very, very difficult journey. Um, and even still, you know, I'm only, I'm 110 days post transplant. And so I'm adjusting to this very hard new normal. Um, but every day and every time I, you know, walk outside, I, I recognize the gift that I've been given. And it's because it's because somebody chose to give it to me. And, you know, I, I, I can't help that somebody unfortunately lost their life. But I, I feel like as a recipient, my goal is to honor them by living well and, and sharing awareness and doing as much as I possibly can for the transplant community. That's my, that's my only goal now. And I think you're doing an incredible job, you know, 110 days yep. post transplant and you're already um, speaking out publicly uh, about your story and raising awareness. I think you're doing incredible things. So thank, thank you. you again for joining us today and for sharing your story. Of course. Um, Dr. Heenberger, uh, your successful career is definitely a testament to your character and dedication to the world of transplant and chronic disease. Um, so basically, you know, brass tacks, what was your primary motivation to follow this career path? And what really inspired you to dive into, you know, the world of transplant and chronic disease? Well, uh, you know, I was always very interested in science, always very interested in medicine, what what um, made people be healthy, what what drove people to to uh, to be sick and, and especially the the treatments that that could fix um, a disease. So I was always very interested in solutions. 
Uh, and that's why I went to medical school. But what was driving me, uh, I think, even more was my own diagnosis. And I, I got to say first, normally I do not look like this. <laughs> my my uh, nose uh, was operated on yesterday because, as mentioned, I have two transplants. I've had two surgeries, one kidney transplant 13 years ago and um, a pancreas transplant 12 years ago. So I have two um, uh, fantastic miracles, a kidney transplant that was given to me from my father and a pancreas transplant that was donated from a, a disease donor, a young woman who died um, in an asthma attack. So I'm forever grateful to her family who elected to, to donate her their daughter's organs so that uh, others could live. Um, and, but due to my transplants and now having been on immune suppressive therapy for a number of years, I'm much more prone to uh, skin cancer. And this surgery that was done yesterday was because of skin cancer. <clears throat> so uh, I'm gonna be fine. I'm gonna look, I think, okay again, or, or as okay as I did before, uh, which is you know not perfect, but, but um, and uh, it's going to take some time. And it is a good lesson. It is a good lesson because, um, again, a transplant is a new chance, a new, a new opportunity to life. And we all need to be really grateful and, and do what we can to, uh, uh, to, to really honor that and, uh, and live better. And, and uh, I think with, a, with an even more mission toward helping others. But um, um, it's not done there, you know, and that's what drives me still. <clears throat> is that we can do better as an industry, as a community, uh, and we need to push uh, for better treatments because um, transplant medication uh, does save lives. It does help us and prevents rejection, but uh, it still does suppress the immune system. So we do have higher risks for cancer. We do have higher risks for infections. And, um, and that's what I continue to work on. I work, um, you know, a, really tirelessly. I'm here today, despite this major surgery yesterday, um, because I do want to raise awareness for, um, for transplantation. I do want to raise awareness for connectivity. I believe very strongly that as patients, we need to be educated. We need to be connected. We need to connect with others who are similar to ourselves. I think that learning from others who have been where we are right now uh, is, is incredibly helpful. No doctor, no nurse can do that. We can learn from our providers you know, about the medication, about the surgical process and so on, but no one but a patient can teach you how to eat afterwards, how to behave afterwards, how to get back to work afterwards. And I think that's the connectivity is very, very important. And education, it's our obligation, I think, is to try to learn as much as possible what about our diseases. And that's what I did when I was diagnosed with uh, type 1 diabetes as a 16-year-old. I was determined to learn everything about my disease uh, so that I could help others, including myself. And that's what drove me my entire career was to try to uh, uh, learn more and to be uh, teaching, um, uh, connected, to be educated, and finally seeking innovation. Uh, for me, innovation is inspirational. Uh, when I think about new possible treatments or even cures, that 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 really makes me uh, happy, uh, makes me uh, uh, and uh, gives me energy. And I think that's true for most of us. If we dwell too much uh, on the problems and not focus on what we can do to solve those problems together, um, we we become uh, easily depressed when we think about how 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 it is, what it's like to live with a chronic illness. So for me, chronic illnesses are just um, you know way of living. We all are affected in some way. Um, everyone is a patient at some point in our lives. And it's what we do with it that matters. Uh, and, and that's what I've been trying really since I was very young is to try to you know, take, take my life and, and live it as much as I can and as best as I can and, and try to solve problems for myself and others. I think that's excellently said. Um, and that's sort of you know, why we're doing our patient ambassador webinar series. We try to feature patients and people who have gone through the transplant process like yourself um, to sort of shed light on the realities of the transplant process. I think that is um, something that, like you said, connects um, all of us in many different ways. And um, I'm so glad you're feeling better after your surgery. Thank you so much for being here today. That means the <laughs> I didn't say I'm feeling better, but I'm, I'm here. <laughs>
<laughs> we, we couldn't thank you more. That is a huge um, sacrifice for you, no. but we appreciate it so much. And your advocacy definitely does not go unnoticed. So uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Hillary, uh, switching over to the living donor side, uh, you know, in 2020, when you sort of came to this decision of, okay, you saw this news story, you, what was there, was there any sort of, you know, revelation for you, revelation for you when you decided, when you made that decision to say, hey, I'm going to donate one of my kidneys to somebody I don't even know. This man uh, was a total stranger to you. So what what was sort of like the click in your head that um, sort of confirmed and made you confident in your decision? Sure. So, yes, there was absolutely a revelation. Um, I remember very clearly watching the news broadcast. It was New Year's Eve and um, I just connected with this man's story in a way that was unexplainable. Um, and I could feel in his voice the desperate need that he had and the helplessness that he felt. And I connected to that because of my family's own medical journey that we went through. Um, you know, when I was I was pregnant with my oldest daughter in 2013, and she was um, an identical twin, and we had lost her twin. Um, and then my daughter went on to be born um, at two pounds and not expected to survive that. Um, she also had two holes in her heart. Um, she ended up having open heart surgery. She was also born with a very rare skin condition on her legs as well, which she still has some treatments for. Um, and then we've kind of got over the hurdles with her. Um, and then my husband was diagnosed with cancer. And so it was a very rough um, couple years, um, of feeling in that desperate place of, I would just give anything for someone to be able to walk through the door and say, I have the cure for you. Um, and in that moment I realized, oh my goodness, I have the cure right here for this man. And I don't, I don't even need it. I have two of these. <laughs> I can, I can spare one. And, um, it was just, it was a very simple decision. Um, you know, once I kind of researched it and knew that it was a safe procedure and that my quality of life would be exactly the same. Um, and by the way, it is better than it was before. <laughs> um, it was a very, very simple decision. Definitely. I think that's, um, I think that, oh, was I muted? Sorry. I, I think that's definitely um, a very interesting, you know, sort of using your own experiences um, and sort of seeing, uh, I think everyone going back to the chronic illness and chronic disease, um, being a patient, everyone like Dr. Karn said, uh, you know, being, everyone has been a patient at some point. So um, sort of empathizing and having that experience, uh, you know, I think that's what brings us together and makes us very human. So Hillary, thank you for sharing. Um, Lisa, I'm, I'm going to switch it over to you. Your line of work and research um, within transplantation as it relates to pregnancy, um, it's certainly very interesting. Can you sort of elaborate a bit more on the topic of pregnancy post-transplant and what sort of made you focus on that specific and may I, may I mention female focused area of study? <laughs> um, I, I think to start with that, I was just at the right place at the right time. Uh, the transplant surgeon who started this registry happened to mention that he wanted to hire someone part-time. I had just had a baby and was very interested in working part-time. So that um, I think just worked with my focus of how I wanted to raise a family. Um, and then 24 years later, here I still am doing this important research because many people were told they couldn't have babies early on. And we didn't know the effects of immunosuppression on pregnancy. And after 30 years, of doing um, this research now, we do have some answers. And I think I'd like to piggyback on what uh, Dr. Hamburger said, is that we wanna educate people. We want women to have the most up-to-date information available to make an informed decision about parenthood after transplant. And I think just going back, um, Dr. Murray, Dr. Joseph Murray, he transplanted the first woman in 1954, uh, 56, and she went on to have a baby two years later. So she was the second set of twins that he transplanted, and pregnancy has been around for that 
for that long. And for years, patients were told, well, you know, you probably shouldn't have any, you know, babies because you got this transplant and we don't want it to affect the transplant. So what we're trying to do is give um, some hope um, uh, pregnancy might not be for everybody, but um, to kind of figure out those parameters of who pregnancy might um, work for. And overall, people who have stable transplant function are on immunosuppression compatible with pregnancy usually do very well. That's certainly reassuring and something that oftentimes, well, many times doesn't get uh, talked about and isn't really, um, and I'd say that's sort of a uh, running theme in um, not just transplant medicine, but medicine in general is sort of the women's side um, of, of, um, of that and how it can impact, you know, a woman's decision um, and the rest of her life. So I think that's, that's an awesome, awesome thing you're doing. Um, thank you. Uh, Sarah, uh, bringing it back to you, um, as I mentioned, you're very open about your transplant journey, which, you know, I appreciate it very much. You also, through your advocacy work, you also focus on targeting myth busting. You know, when it comes to organ donation and transplant, there's so many myths and misconceptions out there. Um, and you specifically like to hone in on those and try to, um, you know, talk about why a certain myth or misconception isn't true. Um, what led you to sort of open up in this way and focus on those myths and misconceptions in your awareness efforts? Yeah, so I think, you know, social media has two sides, right? It, um, you, can, you can use it for good or you can use it for bad. And when I started my, you know, I've been sick a very long time. And when I w was first told of my transplant, it went from, oh, you just need, you know, small intestines to you need multiple organs, you know, an entire new GI system. And I remember, you know, starting to do research and listening to other people talk about transplant, specifically intestinal and multivisceral, and just seeing how much negativity and how much at the time misinformation there was. And I, I started this process two and a half years ago. And so the more questions that I asked my doctors and, um, and the more that it didn't line up with what I was hearing and seeing, you know, I, I just, I, it just became a passion, you know, and whether I was going to be transplanted or not, um, I wanted to make sure, you know, myths like, oh, well, if doctors think that you're an organ donor, um, they won't try to save you in the ER. Like I would hear stuff like that. And as someone who was waiting on the list uh, for multiple organs, stuff like that scared me before. And so I thought if I, if I have a platform where I can, where I can give them the statistics that, that say, this is not, this is not the reality of this situation. Um, then I wanted to be able to do that. And then additionally, um, you know, some transplants don't go well, right? They're, they're, people die waiting on the list every single day. And, um, and so I, you know, another goal of mine is, um, and something I say often is that a hard life doesn't have to mean a bad life. Um, you know, I, I waited a very, you know, 444 days for organs and it, it can be agonizing at times, but choosing to live well and honor the process of organ donation um, and recognizing that for every day that I'm waiting means that my donor is living, right? Um, it's just the perspective that I chose to take. And, and so the more I was on social media and, um, you know, and it does require a vulnerability that I don't usually have. You know, if you meet me in a grocery store, um, <laughs> I'm the most anxious person, you know, in social settings. Um, but when it comes to this, it's just, it's become something I'm very passionate about. And I want to make sure that as many people as I, I can share. And again, you know, even, um, at, you know, everyone who's walked through transplant, you know, there, there, there are poor outcomes, right? You know, even with my own surgery, it's, it's the rarest kind of transplant. It has the highest mortality. But, you know, if your doctors are telling you, yeah, you know, there's a 50-50 shot, it, it's right. You, you can look at it either way. And, and so in, in our house, it was, okay, well, there's a 50% chance 
that I'm gonna get to see my children get married and graduate if I do this. Not a 50% chance that I'm gonna lose my life because I try. And so um, I think that's the beauty of organ donation. And, and again, like was mentioned by one of our the other speakers a, a little bit ago, I, I think just making the decision to live well and intentionally both while you're waiting and then post. And as a woman in transplant, one thing I will say, and one thing I'm learning um, is that when you have an audience that follows you, especially your medical, your medical stuff, um, everything from your weight to your hair to your uh, you know, if someone sees you in public doing something that they think would otherwise be irresponsible for a recipient, you know, I had gone on a trip to um, Tennessee and, um, you know, and people were like, how, how, how could you possibly travel, you know, uh, you know, just, just really like, again, making a conscious effort to, to um, show people that you can live well, that you can live intentionally, and, and that you don't, um, and that organ donation doesn't mean that people are sitting around praying and hoping that someone dies. It means that we're praying that if someone does, that we have the privilege of carrying them and honoring them. And, and, and that's what I've chosen to do. And even being on the other side of it now, you know, um, you know, the amount of comments about my quote, moon face or my prednisone face or, you know, as a woman, those things, the, the, that's not easy to, you know, it, it's not easy to have people on social media, instead of focusing on the fact that you've been given a new life, you know, they're like, oh, well, you've gained weight or your face looks different or your body's changing. And so now, you know, where transplant's concerned, I think it's also important to recognize that, yeah, transplant changes you. And it changes, it doesn't, didn't just change um, my entire GI system, it changed my entire life. And, and it does have an, you know, um, I am on immunosuppression, I am on prednisone, I am on all of these medications that, you know, affect, affect your body and, and in some ways, you know, negatively. Um, but for my friends, you know, I, I know people who have been transplanted who, because of how cruel people have been about them gaining weight or having quote moon face or whatever, have chosen to stop being part of these transplant groups and advocating and, and speaking out because as women, you know, our appearance is everything, right? And, and I don't want it to be about that. I want it to be about, um, again, about what it's supposed to be about, which is living intentionally, living with hope, and being grateful that, yeah, okay, so my face is rounder, and guess what? I got to surprise my kids after not seeing them for 103 days. So yeah, it's worth it, right? Um, and I do think there's a different aspect for women, and not that it's not equally hard for men. I just know that um, as a woman, and at because I've chosen to be so open with it, um, there, there are hard parts up to it, but for every single, you know, negative comment, you know, if I even get one that says I registered to donate or, you know, um, things like that, it, it, it's made it worth it for me to share my story and to look past the, the ugly parts of that. No, definitely. I think that's, that's all, you know, very inspiring. And uh, like you said, uh, social media and putting yourself out there, it's always a risk. And um, there are certain aspects of the transplant process. Um, similar to, you know, talking about just trying to, I think the theme really is coming together as a community, as patients, you know, um, sort of relating to one another, especially if you're a woman who has received a transplant. Um, you know, there are certain things that, you know, men don't normally think about, you know, that they don't really have to think about on a daily basis. And um, mm -hmm. just the fact that you can, um, that you're currently working to bring together people and say, hey, this is normal. This is, this is totally, yeah. totally supposed to happen. Embrace it and just realize that it's a gift. You know, all of these side effects, all of these negative um, side effects of receiving a transplant, it's all for your betterment and better health. So I think, I think everything you've said is, uh, hits it right on the head. It, it just really, um, it's all about, you know, 
coming together and coming out stronger and spreading the, you know, positive awareness message. So Absolutely. thank you, Sarah. That, that was, that was awesome. Um, uh, and we appreciate all your work you're doing for, um, you know, uh, getting the message out there. So, um, Dr. Heenberger, I'm switching it a little bit over to, you know, uh, sort of career focus now as a woman in STEM, which is pretty much a predominantly male dominated, they're all predominantly male dominated fields um, in general, have you ever experienced you know, any certain challenges through your career path that were made harder due to your gender or minority status as a woman? You know, I, I, I keep hearing that, uh, that it is harder and, and I, I, I think it is. Uh, you know, I've never really seen that. I think the way I was raised, I never really saw that I would be um, worse off or I, I would be different because I was a woman. I always just saw that I, I could do anything I wanted to do. And uh, I, 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 I never really considered uh, a man being more appropriate or better at, at really anything. And um, I, so, so I had a very, I think, good childhood. Um, and then when I started experiencing life myself, I realized that most women didn't want to be in, in this uh, industry of science that I really enjoyed. So it was actually in some ways more difficult for me to relate to women who uh, were so not interested in what I was interested in. And I actually related very well to, to men who were interested in, in my space. So, uh, uh, so that was my initial kind of reaction to it. I just thought, okay, well, I, I, I'm really focused on, on, on medicine. I'm focused on biology. I wasn't as interested in physics or math, which is our even more, I would say, male-oriented areas and, 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 or engineering. I'm a terrible uh, engineer. I, I hate anything that or you have to put together. A, so I'm very sexist there. So I have to say, I, I think it's, you know, I, I, I use my gender in a, in a, to my advantage, I think, because I can, as a woman who, um, I'm, there, there, are, there are fewer women in my space, perhaps, I, I kind of see that you get some attention because you're a woman in the space. But then there are certain uh, activities that I really like to delegate to men. Uh, but then I'm not as eager to take on you know, the traditional women's things. Like, I don't think that I should be the one cooking, <laughs> but I'm happy to give my husband, you know, the putting together the, the, the baby carriage or whatever. So I think we have to be a little careful in, in this uh, in, in time right now when gender is so very discussed. And the same thing with diversity, very discussed. Um, and, you know, I love the way that I was raised. And I think that also, and I, you know, I'm Swedish. So in, in the Swedish you know, community where I was raised, we didn't have much diversity. Um, it, it was, uh, but, but what we had was just seen as everyone was the same. And I think that the more emphasis we put on these specific gender roles where, you know, women are supposed to stand on one side of the party and talk about the children and men are talking about sports and the other end of the party, we're aggravating, you know, this, this, uh, disconnect that um, I, I don't think is needed. Uh, to, however, there are differences. And I, I also have to say, we, we, we kind of have to embrace them to, to a certain extent. So you see, I'm incredibly confused on this area. I, um, I, I wanted my way, <laughs> um, but I have a young daughter um, and uh, you know, I, 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 I see that she loves pink. She loves everything princess. She doesn't like green and blue and she doesn't like worms, you know? So I, I, I think what we need to do is to think in ourselves what it is we like to do and what we're good at. And then I think it's our, um, as society and our parents and teachers obligation to give um, the individual those opportunities. So what I would be so against would be to say, okay, all girls need to do this and all boys need to do that because we all are, we have our, our individual, um, you know, preferences. And I think that a good system encourages that choice. Um, and, and, um, uh, and it's wrong if we are being put into these kind of cookie cutter 
um, boxes where we are just encouraged to be in a certain way. Um, uh, you know, again, I think that I've probably faced hurdles because I'm a woman, because I'm a blonde woman in 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 a in a space where you know I may have been without the nose, I may have been seen as someone who should be doing something else but science. Um, and, and I've had to fight that. I've had to kind of prove my um, intelligence a few times. And I think when I was younger. It was more difficult. Now I feel I'm more like the, the professor type and I can say what I want in a way. But but as a 20 something in a space where I, in the space I was, I probably tried to sound smarter than I was very you know immediately because uh, I wanted to set the stage. And that, you know, a young man doesn't have to do, you know, a young man comes in and it's already, you know, assumed that they are in a, in a, in a certain way. So I do think we have to work harder, um, not necessarily bad to have to work a little harder, but um, I think it's very important that the environment is welcoming and, and encourages talent and capabilities um, and does that equally, whatever gender, race, you know, um, background you have. And, uh, if we can get to that at some point, you know, which I think is hard, but with the new generation, I'm very, you know, hopeful because I think the new generation, the, the teens, the 20 somethings are incredibly thoughtful when it comes to this and um, um, embracing what's different versus what is just the norm. Yeah, I think you're absolutely correct. Um, and I, I think uh, there's definitely, it's all about the environment, right? And I think it's sort of, you know, you are what your environment makes you out to be. So I think changing yeah. that environment and changing, you know, the assumptions or the, you know, perspectives that people have um, about young women, especially 20 somethings going into their, you know, uh, desired fields. Um, it's important to look at that in a, in a broader perspective. Um, in a more specific way, you know, if you were talking to say your daughter or any young woman, say college aged, high school aged woman uh, who wants to pursue a career in the medical field, what advice would you give them? Um, what, what would be a word, words of wisdom that you would say yeah somebody, a young woman who's just- I think, I think you gotta follow your passion. I think you want to make your job, what you do more than anything else, something you love. You know, I have never had a day, you know, not, I've had a few, but not, not many days where I have just not liked what I'm doing. And I think if you, if you find your passion, you will work very hard at it and you will do well. Um, but, um, so that's number one. And then I think number two, you have to, you have to work very, very hard. I mean, no one gets anywhere without putting real effort in. So I think that's one difference between maybe, and I'm now being very judgmental, but I think that sometimes with this trend that you don't have to go through college, but you can become a, an internet or a startup billionaire, you know, you can just do whatever you want. That doesn't work. It's very rare that that happens. So you do have to work hard and you do have to have, I think, respect and integrity. I do think you have to respect those who've been where you are trying to go, you know, and you have to you have to listen. Um, and that integrity, which is so important, is also a self integrity because if you start doing things that aren't right ethically, you lose your moral compass, you're, you you lose that 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 integrity, then you're really lost. So to me, integrity, respect, and passion are really incredible key drivers for the success of a young person. If you can really focus on that, I think whatever your passion is, wherever your direction is, you will do you will do well. And not everyone needs to be a scientist. I mean, if you're really interested in fashion, I mean, become a great you know designer. Or if you're you're interested in in art, you know, become that. But but I think you got to work hard, whatever you do, and you you got to have that integrity and respect for others. Definitely. I think um, that's exactly right. You know, following, having, having faith in what you do and, and what you believe in um, it's, it's crucial because if you, you know, if, if that's lacking, it's um, it makes your job not, not as fulfilling and you're not working as up to your full potential as you can. Um, I think that's absolutely right. Thank you, um, Dr. Hedenberger. Um, Hillary, I'm going to switch it over to you going back to living donation. Um, the process of living donation, like transplant, it can be a long one. Um, even just getting to the point of being approved as a living donor can take a, a good chunk of time. 
Um, when you began down the path of becoming a living donor, especially an altruistic living donor, did you see yourself ever becoming, you know, this passionate advocate for donation, living donation and organ donation in general? Did you see yourself becoming such a passionate advocate for donation that you are today? I didn't. When I first started out um, on this journey, I was more, I just wanted to help Mark. I wanted to help that man that I saw in the news broadcast. And I donated to him through the um, National Kidney Registry's voucher program, which created a chain of um, recipients, uh, a total of three. And I felt like once I did that, that I would kind of be done. <laughs> and um, that's not at all the way that it happened. And um, I kind of feel like Sarah, where it's just this great drive to get the word out. I think when I first saw the news broadcast, I didn't even realize that this was a thing. Um, anytime that I had ever heard about kidney donation, it was um, like a, you know, a family donation or donating to a friend, or I never realized that you could just do this for a stranger. Um, so that was something that I, I want to help get the word out about. And I also think it's important that people understand that your life, um, as a donor doesn't change. Um, the only thing that has changed for me is that I don't take Motrin anymore, <laughs> um, Tylenol only. So, um, that's really the only difference that, um, that has happened for me. And I, I think also seeing the impact that my uh, my mentor had on me. Um, I am now good friends with my mentor and he really walked me through the process of donating. And I wanna be able to pass that on to other, other donors as well. Um, you know, I think similar to Sarah, I'm a really private person. So putting myself out there has been tough. And um, just as she said, you know, social media can be a rough road. Um, and even as a donor, um, you know, not everyone will be supportive of you. And there are a lot of critics out there um, as a living donor and as a mother. Um, I've had to field questions of, you know, how can you do that with two young daughters? Like what, how, what if they need a kidney down the road? Um, so there's been a lot of um, criticism that, you know, you have to be ready for. Um, but I, I believe that it's worth it if just one person decides that maybe they can do this. Definitely, definitely. Um, I think I think that's uh, really important is sort of uh, diving into this sort of head first, not knowing about the larger community that's out there. And I think um, really the theme uh, that I that we keep coming back to is creating this community and being a support to others, um, you know, who are going through this experience, um, whether you're going through the living donation process, the transplant process, um, uh, you know, going through your career. Um, I think it's important that, you know, as women and as just, you know, people going through hard experiences, everyone, uh, you know, provide support and um, create sort of a, a backbone for, for the larger community. So thank you, Hillary. Um, lastly, the last question uh, before we go over to our Q&A, I want to direct towards Lisa. Um, just sort of in general, you know, you, you've been working in the transplant field uh, for quite a long time. Um, in your mind, you know, in your opinion, how can women better support one another within the transplant community or the transplant field as, you know, a career field, but also uh, within the broader community? Well, I think one way um, is that like uh, the organization I'm a part of, the American Society for Transplantation, has had this women's health community of practice. And their focus is for women physicians in the transplant field to support and mentor each other. I think that's very important, um, especially with transplant that has been, once again, a male dominated field for a long time. Um, and also we're advocating for our patients. Uh, interestingly, uh, living donors are majority female young female recipient or donors. Um, so the, the questions of pregnancy and long-term outcomes come up for them as well. So, and 
Um, I had a patient when I posted this on my social media page said, you know, she had no one to talk to when she was going through the transplant process as a young mother. And I think that's very important as well as coming together. And I, as much as social media can be tough, I think it can be very helpful because there are uh, platforms um, on social media where you can find other people that are like you. Uh, and it's very important for especially young transplant recipients because there's not many. It's a very, um, I think, unique group um, of you know, transplant patients under 40, um, you know, so it, it's also coming together and supporting each other um, that way as, as well. And that's why I, I've been a part of the women's health community of practice for a long time, knowing that it supports uh, physicians and other uh, female transplant uh, professionals and advocating for our patients because there are times when women may uh, there you know might not have had the opportunity to get transplanted as as quickly as their male counterparts and also to support the large number of donors who are are women as well definitely definitely i think that's um very important um thank you for sharing uh and i think it's about time that we switch it over to the Q&A part of our webinar. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning, um, if you guys have any, if uh, anybody attending today has any questions for our panelists and guest speakers, please submit it in the Q&A box. We already have some uh, questions that have been asked throughout the um, duration of the webinar. Um, the first one I believe is directed to Lisa. Uh, Lisa, sort of, you sort of answered this uh, typing um, in the Q&A, but um, this is from Nancy. Do you see any difference in successful pregnancies depending on what organ has been received? Yes, we do. Um, overall, um, patients, like I said, as long as you have stable transplant function and are on medications compatible with pregnancy, usually patients do well. But we have seen that uh, our lung recipients um, and sometimes kidney pancreas recipients, not that they um, can't have a live birth, but their babies are a little bit smaller and low birth weight compared to um, our kidney, heart, and liver recipients. Liver recipients, um, I think, do the best. Um, they have uh, the, uh, they deliver closest to term and have uh, the biggest babies, I'll say. Um, but it does really, it is very um, patient dependent. Um, and uh, there, uh, obviously with transplant patients, there's a lot of other what we call comorbidities, high blood pressure, diabetes that might go along. So all those things need to be looked at um, prior to having a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Sarah, um, uh, we received an anonymous question. Uh, how do you balance being a mother and a transplant recipient? Um, <laughs> it, it can be difficult at times. Um, you know, my kids, I've been, like I said, I've been sick for a long time. And so I think just finding a balance, um, you know, I, you know, since the COVID pandemic began, I've spent over 200 days inpatient and, and they were never able to visit me during any of those, you know, admits and stuff. And so we had to learn how to do FaceTime and, um, you know, have to do our family calls and our family check-ins every day. Um, and, you know, being able to, I think the hardest thing as a mom was being able to recognize that it's okay if I can't show up at everything. You know, before I would push and I would push and, 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 the balance of trying to be everything to everyone all the time while not only waiting for organs, but now being post-transplant, um, just being able to recognize that it's okay to say no, like I, I can't this time, or, you know, it's okay if dad's the only one who can go to this event. Um, you know, my kids have been incredibly resilient, um, but there's definitely a balance and there's definitely, um, you know, uh, you have to be intentional. And, you know, for my kids, we've always been very honest with them. And so they've known that kind of either way there that that I'm at peace, I, I have a beautiful life. And, and so um, just kind of keeping our 
our house as joyful as possible, even on really hard days, <laughs> has been a goal for all of us. Definitely. I think keeping that positive attitude is the most important um, takeaway from today, it's for huge. sure. Yes. Um, we have a question from another anonymous. Uh, actually, uh, we have a comment here from Hardeep. Um, as a physician and transplant recipient myself, I do feel the patient needs to be informed more about the effects of immunosuppression on pregnancy as part of pre-transplant education. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you want to speak on this a little bit. I just thought it would be um, something uh, valuable just to um, address to the group if anybody wants to add on to that. Yeah, it, I, I think it's vital that if you have a patient, or like if someone is of childbearing age prior to transplant, those uh, parenthood wishes need to be talked about before transplant as well, um, if possible. You know, sometimes transplant are, transplants occur emergently, so it's not something that can be discussed um, long term. But um, once again, uh, a planned pregnancy is best and really talking to your doctors about it, even before transplant, that this is something that you wish to do post-transplant, you know, knowing that you can plan ahead and maybe tailor immunosuppression uh, post-transplant uh, to make that um, happen. Definitely, definitely, thank you. Um, we have a question from an anonymous uh, attendee, Hillary. Who is a female role model for you um, that either played a part in encouraging you to become a living donor or help support you um, through the uh, sort of living donation process? So I would say that my, I would consider my mother to be the person that I kind of went to as um, a sounding board for me. And, you know, I, I think I really look up to her and the way that she raised me was always to do what I could to help others as much as possible. And um, we also talked a lot during that time about, um, you know, this was a process for my own healing as well, that I didn't really anticipate during this process that it would affect me in the way that it did. And that this was such a benefit for me and of every kidney donor I've ever talked to, everyone echoes that same sentiment, that this has been a blessing to me more. I guarantee that I've received more out of this than my recipient has. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. Um, we have an anonymous, I believe this is for Lisa from an anonymous attendee. Being a kidney transplant recipient and female, does the procedure, I'm assuming of, um, they're talking about the kidney transplant, or their medication affect or force menopause at an earlier time for um, those recipients? We haven't um, studied that as much, but I, I feel like I've definitely heard that from patients that I've talked to over the years. Um, I don't think I can point to a specific immunos immunosuppressant that does that, but I know just, you know, because I talked to hundreds of women um, that have said, oh, I, I think, you know, they've told me that I might have gone into menopause early. Um, and whether that's your initial disease that caused you to need a transplant that somehow um, altered, you know, the hormones or if it's the transplant itself, um, I'm just not sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, we have, I think we have one more, just going through this very briefly. I think we have one more question um, from Melissa, and I believe this is um, directed towards Dr. Hehenberger and um, as well as Lisa, I would assume, but um, what exciting treatments do you see uh, coming in the future? Yeah, you want me to start? I can start. Sure, go for it. <laughs> yeah, no. So I, I, I'm, I'm really excited about um, cell therapy. Uh, you know that that to me is the is the future. It's not tomorrow. It's not is not today. But we have seen over the past you know six to nine months uh, really interesting uh, advancements in this space. I mean, personally, I'm interested, of course, in type one diabetes, and we've seen how cells now uh, can be created. Um, and uh, replace uh, uh, beta cells that are both insulin sensitive and, and uh, uh, glucose sensitive and can be insulin sec secreting. 
However, the biggest problem is the immune system, and um, uh, you know, cell therapy with immune suppression is 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 a bridge toward cell therapy. But you know, immune suppression to me is still the biggest issue for organ transplant um, individuals, such as uh, us here on the panel, but also for cell therapy. Cell therapy kind of solves the problem of demand and supply. Uh, you know, every year we have people dying on the list, which is, uh, you know, again, we, we have to be so grateful to individuals such as Hillary and, and, and my father, uh, who are living donors who can really help, but um, we, ha we don't have enough. So getting cell therapy and meaning cells that can be created to, to replace organs instead of just getting organs from a living donor or a disease donor is the future from a supply perspective, but we do need to address immune suppression. And I haven't seen much when it comes to uh, new treatments uh, to replace the tacrolimus, azathioprine, mycophenolate, all these drugs, or, or even prednisone uh, that some people are on. Um, and that to me is really a call uh, for action to industry and scientists is to try to work on better immune suppressants. Um, so that we, we do not have to suffer the side effects um, of, of immune suppression that so many of us are. I also think it's been in the news recently about um, what's called xenotransplantation. Yeah. Um, would, would be my only other comment. Um, I've been hearing about it for 30 years and I feel like this is the first huge advancement, um, you know, showing that the pig heart can um, go into a human and they've been able to genetically alter the animals so that we don't get the viruses and the same with the kidney. And, and hopefully, you know, we'll see more of that um, in the coming years as well. Definitely, the, the news headlines are um, about transplant are at least in the last two years, ever since uh, COVID, there's, it's, they're all very optimistic. And I think there's a lot of hope for the future and technological advances are certainly helping our fight to eliminate the wait for people waiting a uh, life-saving transplant. Um, Karin, I'm gonna keep you on here. We have one a question um, from an anonymous attendee. How does transplant life work to help women in transplantation? So, so thank you for that question. So Transplant Life, Life with a Y, um, is a digital platform for, for, for anyone uh, who is interested in, in organ transplant, both as a patient as well as a care partner, and those who are, are, are donors, of course, as well. Uh, we're considering being a donor and, uh, and women and men uh, can join. And um, uh, we have a discussion forum, which is safe and moderated in contrast to, to perhaps Facebook, um, and, and where you can really ask questions um, to the, the whole group um, and, and get into conversations. We also have one-on-one -on -one connections, which in my case was really important. When I, I, when I was told I needed a kidney transplant, I really wanted to connect with that one person who was similar to myself, similar life stage. I think the Lisa's point about planning to have a child, you know, you may not want to talk about that into a big group of men and older women or younger women and may not be interested in that, but finding that person who has gone through what you want to go through. So the one-on-one -on -one connection to me was critical as we build transplant life. And then we also have a data tracker. So you can feel more empowered by having your data in a separate section. So when you see your physician or your nurse or coordinator, you can come and have that say, this is what happened to me over the past three months from a biometric and qualitative data. We also show seminars on transplant life. So we are collaborating with Columbia University Hospital. So we have key opinion leaders, both the physicians and nurses and researchers. Uh, we actually have a special seminar on the pig transplants uh, coming up. And, um, and that is monthly. So please, please join that. It's, uh, it's really, really nice to see those streamed. And we will also be adding more content uh, as we are building Transplant Life really for patients by patients. So we want input, um, but I encourage women and men to join. And I think as, as women, we wanna connect with others either in a group or as one-on-ones. Definitely. That, that's awesome. Um, thank you for what you're doing and for promoting um, Transplant Life. I think that's an absolutely vital part, as we've discussed uh, here today, uh, is connecting, that connectivity and feeling like you're really deep and part of a, a community that is valuable and helpful for your recovery or wherever you're at, uh, what stage you're at in the transplant process. Um, we have, oh, we have some more questions coming in. Um, uh, 
let's see from uh, Sarah from an anonymous attendee, what has been the most empowering part of becoming a transplant recipient? Oh gosh, that's that's difficult. Um, I, I I think the most empowering part, honestly, has just been that I because now I've now experienced um, you know the entire process. Um, I, I think just being able to now encourage others um, who who are waiting, who are recipients, um, like was mentioned previously. Um, finding people and connecting people like who have had the type of transplant that I had had um, and being able to encourage them and walk that process with them. Every transplant is different, um, but to be able to literally, you know, say to someone like, these are the things doctors aren't telling you, right? You know, I, I for a year and a half thought that I had planned and prepared for every aspect of the transplant that I was going to have. And then I had the transplant and about 99% of it was not stuff I was like, it was expecting. And so um, to now be able um, to, to use my voice and, and kind of um, testimony, um, you know, I think it's empowering just in the sense that I can, I can be a, a voice of encouragement because yes, this has been the hardest four months of my life. But again, that doesn't mean that it hasn't been worth every ounce of heart. And, and I think that it's incredibly important that people are encouraged in, in the process because I did not get that and I did not have that um, because it's not something you see often in the intestinal and multivisceral communities because the outcomes are, are sometimes very poor. And so it's been, you know, very empowering to be able to speak with Good Morning America and all of these, you know, news stations and literally do nothing except spread the hope and, and, um, and gratefulness that, that organ donation has brought to my family. We had our first family dinner and my children literally couldn't even eat because they could not believe we were sitting and having a meal together. Um, and that's the beauty of, you know, what, what organ donation has, has given our family. And, and that's what it gives other families too. And so to be able to share that with other people um, from a real life perspective, like it, it, it's, it's not just donating, it's literally giving us life. And so I love being able um, to empower and encourage people who, who are on the list. And, um, and it's just, it's been an honor to, to share and, and to encourage. Definitely. And I think um, what you're doing, what everyone, uh, our, all of our panelists on the webinar today are doing are, are, is, um, you know, very valuable. And I think just um, promotes the cause and promotes awareness of organ donation and the life-saving gift transplant um, so much more. So thank you, um, everyone, um, not just our guest speakers, but everyone who uh, joined us today. Um, as I mentioned, the goal of this webinar was to really recognize the contributions and successes of women within the transplant community, uh, while also shedding more light on the female perspective um, of different people within that community. And I think um, the biggest takeaway is that it is a community. Community. It is a tight knit community and um, really getting, uh, you know, having that experience, uh, connecting individually on that personal level is crucial for people going through the transplant process. And I think that's um, something that, you know, um, as a woman, there are a lot of different aspects of the transplant community that are a little bit more specific. And it would be nice to have resources um, that you can access to sort of address, you know, like the uh, transplant pregnancy registry, things that really um, are specific to uh, a woman's experience. So um, thank you again for everyone joining us. If you have any questions that were not addressed or answered in today's webinar, please do not hesitate to contact us at info at chrisklugfoundation.org. I will include that in the chat very quickly right here. Um, and also, if you look in the chat, we also have some links um, to our foundation, the Chris Klug Foundation, as well as Lifebulb, Transplant Life, um, National Kidney Donor Organization. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, Hearts for Us, our, present, our uh, sponsor, as well as transplantpregnancyregistry.org. Um, so if everyone, uh, if you'd like to take a look at those resources, feel free. Um, we've included those links to the websites in the chat. Um, 
And April is Donate Life Month next month. So we're encouraging everyone to get involved, show your support by hosting an event or maybe partner with us for a webinar. Um, we also invite you to share. If you have a donor story you'd like to share it, we can feature it as part of Donate Life Month. Um, thank you again to everyone for attending today. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks again, guys.